Hello, welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you're tuning in from. Um, this is the last of um, 2022's Facebook for Neurologies webinar, um, and um, we want to uh, have a special shout out that this is the pre-Christmas edition, um, so a little free present for you today. This is also the World Cup edition, we're going to be having a little chat about that probably at the end. Um, of this um, session. Laurent and I um, uh, got some things to say about that. So, um, but without further ado, thank you very much for tuning in. Um, and uh, thanks very much to Hallmark Advanced Veterinary Imaging for sponsoring this session. Today, we have great pleasure uh, in introducing um, Dr. Carlotta. Um, now, I'm really sorry that I'm, I'm terrible um, pronunciation, but Re Remeli. Yes. Yeah. Is, that, is that okay? Oh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I uh, have great pleasure in introducing you and uh, thankfully didn't um, destroy your name. A uh, so brief introduction to Carlotta, who is very brave being here today. Uh, all our speakers um, uh, this year have, have been in the early stage of their career. We want to encourage that moving moving forward. Um, uh, this is a great opportunity to to share your work with, with people interested in the neurology field. Uh, Carlotta graduated um, from the University of, of Padua in Italy. And so shout out to all of our friends at, at that university there. Um, in the final two years of study in Padua, uh, she was an intern student at the neurology unit and um, Hence, there's going to be some uh, presentation coming up very shortly of some of the work that was done there. Currently, Carlotta is taking part in a one-year rotational training program at the Anacura Veterinary Hospital e Portoni Rossi in Bologna. Oh, that was good, eh? Um, <laughs> and is going to take part in a rotational internship program starting from January 2023 at the same institution. And I believe um, Laurent and I have a friend there, Dr. Marco Bernardini, and hopefully Marco is listening. Marco, um, it's been a long time and we uh, need to get together for a drink. Um, um, but uh, thanks for uh, your support here um, and thanks for uh, supporting Dr. Carlotta Ramelli. Uh, today. So I'm going to hand over to you, Carlotta. Uh, thank you so much for giving up your time. I know it's early evening there in Italy um, and uh, you've got your, your work to present. So thank you so much for turning up. I'm going to hand over to you now and uh, Laurent will, will put your presentation on the screen. So good luck and take it away. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Platt, for, the, for introducing me. And thank you to join this journal club. It is a honor for me to be here and tell you about this paper titled Magnetic Resonance Imaging Highlights the Meningeal Involvement in Steroid Response in Meningitis Arteritis and Suggests the Inflammation of the Surrounding Tissues in 70 Cases. It was published on Frontiers in Veterinary Neurology and Neurosurgery in August 2022. First of all, a brief review of the state of art of the pathology. SRMA is an immunomediated disorder commonly recognized in dogs. Even if young dogs between 6 and 18 months of age are usually affected, the disease is also reported in older dogs. Any breed can be affected with a prominent predisposition in Beagle, Boxer, and Bernays Mountain Dog, which are the breeds in which the pathology was described first, but are predisposed also Border Collies, Springer Spaniel, Climber Runner, Nova Scotia Duck Tolly Retriever. Jack Russell and Whippet. An acute and a chronic form of the disease may occur. The former is characterized by cervical pain and stiffness, whereas in the latter, neurological deficits are usually present. It is also reported that the ceremony affected dogs may also show myositis and polyarthritis. The intravitam diagnosis is based mainly on patient signalment, history, neurological examination, and cerebrospinal fluid analysis, I will say CSF from now. Whereas the role of the magnetic resonance imaging as MRI in the diagnostic workup of CERME is poorly described in literature. What is present is mainly reported in three papers. The first is the review by Andrea Tipol of 2010, an update on steroid responsive meningitis arteritis 
where it is reported that MRI may demonstrate conscious enhancement of the meninges. In this paper by Minaga and colleagues of 2013 about spinal cord disease of known origin, uh, they found steel muscle changes apparently associated with inflammatory cervical spinal cord disease. And this, the last is an American paper by Lau and colleagues of 2019 about clinical characteristics, breed differences, and quality of life in North American dogs with acute cerebral responsive meningitis arthritis. And the authors found in the MRI of some dogs, meningeal contrast enhancement, T2 hyperintensity or contrast enhancement of the cervical paraspinal muscles, and lesions within the cervical spinal cord with viable contrast enhancement. Therefore, we can say that extensive reports about the usefulness of MRI and the diagnosis of CERME are lacking. Then the aims of the study were first to investigate the characteristics of MRI studies of the cervical spine of dogs diagnosed to be affected by CERME, and second, to compare the diagnostic capability of MRI obtained with low-field and high-field MRI units. This was a multicentric retrospective case series with two centers involved, the Veterinary Teaching Hospital of the University of Padua and the Anicura Veterinary Hospital Iportoni Rossi in Bologna. For what concerns materials and methods, we searched in the database for SRMA cases between 2008 and 2021. Inclusion criteria were data about signament, history, and neurological examination available, as well as CSF information concerning cell count, neutrophil percentage, and albumin concentration. About MRI, the MRI studies had to be available for review and had to include at least pre- and post-contrast T1 weight images, either with or without fat suppression, and acquired in both the transverse and sagittal planes. Moreover, T2 weight images or steer images in the transverse plane had to be present. And the post-processing subtraction technique was used on the T1 weight images to highlight contrast agent update. A low field scanner was used between 2008 and 2018, whereas a high field scanner was used between 2018 and 2021. This table show the, shows the main structures we analyzed in the study in the first column. So meninges, nerve roots, synovium of the articular facets and muscles. For each structure, a score from 0 to 2 was assigned with 0, meaning no contrast enhancement, 1, meaning mild contrast enhancement, and 2, meaning marked contrast enhancement. Then, the MRIs were globally classified based on the distribution of the enhancement as absent or involving one or more of the following cervical structures, so meninges, synovium of the articular facets, and muscles. Then, MRI features and CSF analysis results were compared and statistical analysis was performed. A two proportion Z test for equality of two percentage was applied to compare in low field and high field MRI the enhancement of the structures, the incidence of synovial and muscular enhancement, and the increased conspicuity of the meningeal enhancement through the subtraction technique. A cruciscal wall is non parametric test was applied to analyze the CSF cell count distribution in the free MRI groups based on the degree of meningeal enhancement and in the free MRI groups based on the distribution of the enhancement between cervical structures. And this test was applied on total MRIs then on low field MRI alone and on high field MRI alone. Moving on, talking about results. 70 cases were included. About the medical records review, there were 50% of male and 50% of female. Breeds most represented were boxer, mixed breed, Bernese mountain dogs, followed by other breeds. Median age at first presentation was 10 months. And the duration of clinical signs was less than four days in 25 dogs, between four and 10 days in 24 dogs, and more than 10 days in 21 dogs. 53 dogs received previous therapies in the 10 days before referral, consisted of glucocorticoids in nine dogs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in 27 dogs, 
opioids in 24 dogs, and antimicrobials in 24 dogs. Cervical pain or stiffness were present in all dogs, and other clinical signs were paresis in 17% of dogs, ataxia in 20% of dogs, and pyrexia in the 75% of dogs for which temperature was available, so 24 out of 32 dogs. In 57 dogs, information about the follow-up were present, and the response to the immunosuppressive treatment was reported to be good in all of them. About CSF analysis, CSF was collected from the cerebellum medullary system in 90% of cases and from the lumbar circle space in the remaining 10%. Media cell count was 945 white blood cells in the corridor, and the microprostitosis, meaning more than 500 white blood cells in the corridor, was found in more than 64% of cases. On the threshold cell count, more than 60% of neutrophils were found in almost 93% of cases. For what concerns MRI image review, Enhancement of one or more structures was found in 98.6% of cases, as we can see in this figure. We have T1 weight pre-contrast images in the upper row and T1 weight post-contrast images in the lower row. The post-contrast images we can see from left to right, meningeal contrast enhancement here, nerve root enhancement here, synovial enhancement here, and muscle announcement here. Meningeal announcement was found in 87.1% of cases, whereas nerve root announcement was found in 14.3% of cases. Synovial announcement was found in 48.6% of cases, and muscle announcement was found in a similar percentage of 48.6%. The post processing subtraction technique increased the conspicuity of the announcement at meningeal level in 42 cases, meaning 60%, as we can see in this figure. From left to right, we have pre contrast T1 with image in A, post contrast T1 with image in B and the subtracted image in C. In the subtracted image, we can see pointed by the arrow, a meningeal enhancement, which is not easily detectable in B. A comparison between T1 weight images and T1 weight fat sat images was made in seven cases in which both the sequences were present. And when meningeal enhancement was present, this was better seen of fat sat images in all but one cases. Moreover, the announcement was easily detectable on T1 weight images only for subtraction, as, see, as we can see in, uh, in this figure. So we have uh, T1 weight images in the upper row and T1 fat sat images in the lower row. From left to right, we have pre contrast images, post contrast images, and the subtracted images. In the post contrast fat sat image, we can see pointed by the long arrow, a meningeal announcement here, which is visible in the T1 weight images only for subtraction and pointed by the short arrow here. A comparison between T2 weight images and steel images was made in eight cases. Muscle lesions were present in five cases, always better visible in steel. And this figure is not in the paper, but I want to share it with you because we can see a muscular hyperintensity in both the sequences, but better visible in steel here. On the comparison between low field and high field MRI, no statistical difference was found regarding the conspicuity of denouncement in the meninges, synovium of the articular facets and muscles, whereas a mild significant difference was found in the identification of nerve root denouncement. The subtraction technique increased the conspicuity of the announcement at the level of meninges in almost 70% low field cases and 40% high field cases. Moreover, in 10% low field cases and 15% high field cases, the diagnosis would have been missed without the use of subtraction. Anyway, no significant difference was found between low field and high field MRI in the utility of this technique. About the comparison uh, between MRI findings and CSF analysis results, 
Uh, these graphs show the CSF cell count distribution in the free MRI groups based on the uh, degree of mean injury enhancement. So we have group zero with no enhancement, group one with mild enhancement, and group two with marked enhancement. Graph A is about all MRI, graph B is about low field MRI, and graph C is about high field MRI. We can see that if we consider all MRIs, a significant difference between CSF cell count is present between all the three groups, whereas if we consider only low field MRI, a significant difference in CSF cell count is present between group 1 and group 2, and no significant difference between groups are present if we consider only high field MRI. This graph shows that the CSF cell count distribution in the free MRI groups based on the distribution of the announcement between cervical structures. So group one are cases with meningeal, synovial, and muscular announcement. Group two are cases with meningeal announcement alone. And group three are cases with synovial and or muscular announcement, but no meningeal announcement. Again, the analysis was made on all MRIs in A, on low field MRI in B and on high field MRI in C. And we can see that considering all MRIs, a significant difference in CSF cell count is present between group 1 and group 3, whereas no significant difference are present if we consider only low field MRI or only high field MRI. Now uh, I want to discuss with you the result grouped by the aims of the study. So the first aim was to investigate the characteristics of MRI studies of the cervical spine of dog, dogs diagnosed to be affected by CERME. And MRI showed abnormalities in 98.6% of cases confirming the usefulness of this exam. And MRI features suggestive of meningeal inflammation were found in 87.1% of cases whereas the incidence of synovial enhancement and muscle enhancement was the same for both conditions and was 48.6%. Cases of SRMA and polyarthritis, as well as cases of SRMA and myositis have been reported in the literature. And about SRMA and polyarthritis, in this paper by Webb and colleagues, they found the responsive meningitis arthritis in dogs with non-infectious, non-erosive, idiopathic, monomediated polyarthritis. And this condition was found in the 46% of cases with polyarthritis and cervical hyperesthesia. So we think that the high incidence of synovial enhancement detected on MRI in our study reinforced the hypothesis of that study that polyarthritis could be more frequent than clinically expected. About the CRMA and myositis. In this paper we quoted before, Minaga and colleagues found steel muscle hyperintensity in the cervical muscles associated with inflammatory spinal cord disease of known origin, and they supposed the extension of the meningeal inflammation to the paraspinal muscle for spinal nerve roots, as could happen in some of our cases. But since the majority of our cases with muscle announcement didn't have a concomitant radical announcement, we suppose the spread of inflammation also for arteries, which in addition could explain the presence of the announcement in the synovium of the articular facets. About the subtraction technique, the utility of this technique at spinal liver is, rep is reported, especially for areas of contrast announcement that are close to fat, whose bright signals tend to hide pathologic lesions, quoting Dennis and May. And our findings fully support its application so we would recommend the use of subtraction on MRI of suspected CRMA cases as the meninges are contiguous to the epidural fat. About C images, in the previous report on inflammatory spinal cord disease, muscular hyperintensity was seen in most of the cases and was detected better in steer than in T2 weight images. We have seen a similar feature in our population, supporting the inclusion of steer sequences in the MRI protocol of cases uh, with suspected SRMA. The second aim of the study was to compare the diagnostic capability of MRI obtained with low-field and high-field MRI units. 
first, no statistical difference between low feed and high feed MRI was found regarding the conspicuity of the announcement in the meninges, synovium of the ticular facets and muscles. Then a low field MRI can be used during the workup of CERME cases. The only structure for which a significant difference was found was nerve roots, for which a high field MRI was more efficient than low field MRI, probably for the highest special resolution of a high field scanner. About the subtraction technique, no significant difference was found between the utility of subtraction in low field and high field MRI. So its application is always recommended regardless of the field used. About fat suppressed images, the acquisition of, of fat sat sequences is generally performed only with high field MRI because the chemical shift between fat and water is, is too small in low field MRI to achieve a selective chemical saturation of fat without also producing water saturation. And this again highlights the higher efficiency of a high field MRI. About the cross match between MRI findings and CSF results, based on the graphs I showed you before, we found that with a low field scanner, the more the meninges are inflamed, the more the announcement is visible. While a high field scanner permits the identification of the announcement regardless of the degree of inflammation shown by the CSF analysis. And we think this is probably due to the higher spatial resolution of a high field MRI. Instead, when pulling all the cases together, stronger was the degree of contest enhancement in MRI and significantly higher was the CSF cell count in the CSF analysis. And we think that a possible explanation for this trend is the increased vascular permeability due to the arteritis in this inflammatory condition, which could explain both the contest agent leakage and the cellular migration from the vascular compartment. In nine cases, meaning 13% of cases, there was no meningeal announcement in spite of an abnormal CSF. This is not so un unexpected if we consider that lack of contest announcement in inflammatory condition is well described in the literature for what concern the other uh, meningocephalitis of known origin, as reported in these papers. And moreover, Four out of nine dogs in our study received glucocorticoids or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs treatment before referral, which could have altered the MRI findings. Anyway, uh, eight out of nine cases with abnormal CSF but no meningeal enhancement had concurrent synovial and or muscular enhancement. And the CSF cell count of these dogs was, was significantly lower than the CSF cell count of cases with synovial, muscular, and concurrent meningeal enhancement, despite a greater percentage of cases belonging to the latter group received glucocorticoids or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug treatment before referral. Then we could speculate that different forms of SRMA or different stages with different tissue targets could exist and future studies are clearly needed to investigate this hypothesis. Lastly, according to the initial search of the database, two dogs had a suspected diagnosis of SRMA in spite of normal CSF analysis and were therefore excluded from the study. The first case was a Bernays Mountain dogs of 22 months of age with a previous diagnosis of SRMA 15 months earlier and this time, surgical pain was found on neurological examination and meningeal enhancement was found on MRI. As chronic relapsing cases may have normal CSF, we suppose this dog could be affected by a second episode of a SRMA. The second case was a boxer of four months of age with a history of cervical pain and the enhancement of the synovium of two pairs of articular facets was found on MRI then this dog could be affected by primary polyarthritis with cervical involvement. But since a concurrent sign of an announcement was found in almost half of our SRMA cases, and since it's reported that SRMA cases may sometimes have a normal CSF, we suppose that this dog could also be affected by um, a form of SRMA plus polyarthritis in a non-typical form, 
in a stage in which the aberrant immunomediated response currently does not involve neurological structures. But future studies are need, needed also on this topic. This study has several limitations, mainly due to the retrospective nature. First of all, uh, there was no common goal standard diagnostic test, probably for the long duration of the study, encompassing a 13 year period. Then, even if the diagnosis was made on a combination of clinical and diagnostic information, the risk that a few cases with the other disease mimicking CERME were included does exist. Then, MRI protocols vied for the years. And another limitation is the lack of control group and the fact that the observers were not blind about neurological examination. Then, a limitation is the lack of histopathological confirmation for both neural and external neural tissues. So, which are the conclusions of the study? Answering the first aim, the most frequent MRI finding in SRMA cases is meningeal enhancement, often accompanied by synovial and or muscular enhancement. And when meningeal enhancement is absent, less marked CSF abnormalities are usually present. Answering the second aim, both a low field and high field MRI have a good diagnostic overall capability. Alpha high field MRI enables a more for investigation thanks to specific sequences such as fat sat sequences. So, concluding, this study highlights the usefulness of MRI as a complementary tool to CSF analysis in the diagnostic workup of SRMA and suggests a possible diagnostic role of MRI in cases with a normal CSF but a clinical presentation suggestive of this condition. And clearly, further perspective studies are needed to complete the description of MRI patterns in SRMA cases and to more reliably compare low field and high field MRI. So that's all, and thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to try to answer the question you may have. Thank you so much, Carlotta. And uh, I have to say, I'm really impressed, you know, by not only the quality of the, you know, the, the study, but also, um, you know, how professional you've been in, you know, in doing this presentation. I need to remind everyone that Carlotta um, qualified, uh, would you qualify last year, isn't it, from uh, that school or a year ago? Yeah, one year and a half. And uh, so, you know, from someone at the level of her career, um, you know, all all uh, commendation, and I think you've got a very bright future, you know, in front of you. Um, we have a question from another yeah. very smart, uh, you know, um, neurologist, uh, Kuhn. And Kuhn is asking, um, you can read the question, Carlotta, while, while I, I discuss it. Um, there have been, uh, as you mentioned in your presentation, cases of meningitis with concurrent polar arthritis. In the cases where you saw uh, synovial enhancement, did you correlate whether or not there was also evidence of polar arthritis in this case? So did you do joint tap and see if it correlate with the synovial enhancement? Uh, sorry, I need to <laughs> refresh my yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll leave you to read, I'll leave you to read. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so did, did your dog at John tap, you know, when, um, when you diagnosed meningitis and did the joint tap show an inflammation and at the same time you could see. Okay. You know, okay. I got it. Sorry. On MRI of the synovial joint. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, the answer is no, uh, okay. no, we, um, it was a retrospective study, so uh, we didn't have uh, that about um, the synovial of the, the other joints and also on or about the appendicular joints. So uh, we didn't have this data, but uh, we think that it would be interesting to analyze it in a prospective study maybe and to uh, try to of other joints uh, to confirm or disprove this um, concurrent present of SRMA and polyarthritis, I think. Okay. Um, there is another question from Befan. I'll leave you to read, but Befan is, is asking whether or not you collected both cisternal and lumbar CSF, uh, especially when you report some of them at normal cell count. Very old study um, show that it, there is more diagnostic 
yield if you collect with lumbar puncture in this case, but I don't know if you collect it from both as well. Uh, no, we, um, I think probably for the retrospective nature of the study, we have just the um, data about uh, the, on the database. So where is uh, reported maybe that uh, CSF was collected from the lumbar sarca space I don't know if they tried on the uh, cerebellum the resistor and they uh, didn't uh, take it, or yeah. I, I, I can answer the question for this. Yeah, obviously, people need to know it was a retrospective but, study, so, you know, um, um, that but I think it's, and... Sorry, yeah, I think no, it was collected from one uh, side. From one. Yeah. Good, good. There is a, a fairly similar question. Um, um, the, the second part is exactly what we discuss, you know, deciding, I think someone will agree that in the case of meningitis or suspected meningitis, um, I think for the people listening to us, is like a, with, a, you know, if you suspect polyarthritis, the more joint you collect, the more diagnostic yield. And I think with meningitis, it's always best practice to try to collect from cystinal mm -hmm. and lumbar. Um, to okay. increase, obviously, the, the chance of, of diagnosis. Um, but the, 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 the first question was, um, what kind of secondary treatment would you use in cases that don't respond well to steroid? I mean, what in the, the case that you've reviewed, um, what was the second line treatment when steroids were not, you know, doing the, the job? Okay. Uh, so um, I'm afraid, but I don't have the answer because uh, this work was about the diagnosis. So uh, we found that the, um, for all the cases in which there was uh, information about the follow up, the, the response to the treatment was reported to be good. But uh, in all of the cases, I think it was with glucocorticoids. And I don't remember now if some case had uh, an art therapy. Uh, yeah. But I think that you have more. <laughs> experience yeah. the meaning in, in this thing so no, we, we can help you with that i think um I, I, someone can also say I, I think from what i've seen over the years compared to cases of meo meningitis when you rule out when they when they fit all the box you know they are young adult dog or immature dog and you got csf with neutrophilic pleocytosis and you rule out all the infectious you know cause they, i mean we'll say the large majority respond very well to immunosuppressive those of steroids. The cases that don't tend to do well tend to be the case where steroids have been used maybe or they have been reduced too quickly um, and they could be you know more difficult to control long term. Um, I think there have been only very few cases where I needed to add something else um, and something else is like for a lot of immune mediated you know condition there is no ideal treatment, and it could be anything from azathioprine, cytarabine, cyclosporine, the flenomide, and, and so on. But I don't know, Simon, if you have the same uh, the, the same experience with that. You're muted. There we go. Okay. You know, I'd agree. I, I think that this is a condition that you hit it really early aggressively with steroids and it doesn't seem to need an additional medication in most of the time. Um, Laurent and I are of a generation where we love steroids, um, although you know, we, we uh, agree that there are some problems with them and, and, and people better than us and in the newer generations look to steroid spare and so although it might not be necessary to add a second drug, there, there's a feeling that adding a second drug means that you could use less steroids um, and so potentially have less of the harmful side effects that would be associated with their, with their use. Um, but, but it may not be on a purely disease treatment basis, it may not be necessary. And there is another question, Carlotta, we may answer for you. Um, how long do you keep them on steroid? And then Thomas also asked, when do you try to reduce? I, I think Thomas, you know, with immune mediated disease, you need to consider that you need to tailor the treatment to the dog. And it would be wrong to try to fit a given treatment plan to every single dog. Um, and personally, I usually start one mic per kick BID uh, for at least two weeks. Um, and what I would expect if everything go well is that within two weeks, there is um, return of, you know, the sign are resolved. 
And if I achieve that, then I'm going to reduce every two weeks and I keep them on treatment for a minimum of three months. Um, you could potentially run CRP, you know, after three months to see if he's elevated or re and or repeat the CSF to guide you um, or purely go on clinical sign. If after two, mo after two weeks there was no good improvement, that's where I will consider um, adding something else because I would be worried to keep the dog on a high dose steroid for, you know, too long as well. But it's really to adapt the treatment to the dog. You know, there is no, um, you know, f uh, something that fit every single dog the same. Simon, again, if you want to add. Yeah, it is, it is an individual, but a little bit like the whole MUE, MUO um, phenomena that we're treating based on clinical signs. And as Laurent said, there are some, there are some, biochemical um, monitoring parameters, CSF and serum that we that we could use. And many owners, if the dog's doing well, probably don't really want to go through another CSF, CSF tap, but that, that is documented as a way to at least establish whether there's ongoing inflammation. And then the CRP, the, CRP, the C-reactive protein, is, is probably a, now a, a more commonly pursued um, manner for, for us to see if there's an ongoing inflammation as well but even with all those being normal um if we reduce the medication to hopefully stop it sometimes there's, there are relapses and there was a um you know comment from um alex um mentioning a treat uh, an, an article about srm yeah I, I, I agree with you alex the, but the thing you need to maybe take into a consideration is that if there is you know a treatment that is easy to give at home. And we know that for, let's say, more than 90% of the dogs, they will respond to that. The flip side of using cytarabine is that it's a cytotoxic drug. Um, you, need, you need to take a lot of precaution when giving it. There is a cost implication. I mean, in the UK, to give cytarabine with all the cytotoxic regulations um, have a high cost. You mean the owner coming back as well to have the cytarabine given? That's something to weigh. And personally, as someone said, with the generation where, you know, if something works and, you know, it's cheap and you do the trick, then we tend to go for that. It doesn't mean you should not use satarabine, but you need to put in the balance the cost and all, all what you imply as well using satarabine. I think we've done a question. Um, Carlotta, I just want to reiterate that, you know, fantastic job. Uh, you know, you should be very proud of yourself to put yourself forward you know, to come on this forum, I think is amazing. And as I say, I've got no doubt your f the future will be very bright, you know, for you. Um, I don't think the future of the England, England team at the World Cup will be so bright. Um, Here we go. Here we yeah, go. <laughs> I think we need, to, we need to talk about it very briefly. Um, as you know, France is playing against England on Saturday. Mm -hmm. At least they can leave the World Cup uh, with a held, head held very high. Um, having gone up to the quarterfinal and losing against the best team in the world. So, you know, don't, don't, yeah, still thing is a good achievement. You know, it's still, a, it's still good enough. You know, don't be too Laurent apologized. Laurent, Laurent is apologizing. Laurent is apologizing to all our Brazilian um, viewers right now who might, <laughs> who might have an argument. Maybe the Dutch, maybe they'll have an argument as well. But, um, we uh, on our next on our next webinar to be held at the beginning of February when England quite possibly um, are world champions. Um, we will review we will review this this topic again. But thank thank you again, Carlotta. Really appreciate it. As Laurent said, a, a fantastic presentation. Um, re really great, especially considering uh, your your stage in the career. It's, it really is great. Thanks to everyone who who tuned in. Um, today and thanks again to Hallmark Advanced Veterinary Imaging for sponsoring this session um, and thanks to the nightclub wherever it is that is hosting Laurent's um, current uh, video camera with uh, with the um, evening evening lighting there. Um, join us again at the start of next year or the first week of February hopefully for the for the 2023 um, Facebook webinar series and any one of you out there who have a publication in the works or know it's getting accepted soon, um, a study that you'd like to present, please um, 
Carlotta has set the bar very high, but please um, put your name forward, get in touch with us, um, and we would love to give you a platform here to talk about your study. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful Christmas, everyone, and thanks, Carlotta, again. Bye-bye. Thank you for this opportunity. Yep. Thank you.